Welcome to John Gets Games. This is my new games radar vlog for January of 2024, and today I'll be talking about 28 games in this episode. Now, I will go through these in alphabetical order, and I do want to mention that if you prefer to listen to this in podcast form, then you can gain access to that as an exclusive perk by becoming a Patreon supporter of this channel. You can learn more about that by going to patreon.com slash John Gets Games, and there's also a bunch of other exclusive perks you could get access to. Now, uh, coming back to this video, I do want to ask that if there are any games that you think I missed, or you have thoughts about any of the games that I discuss, then please leave a comment down below because I love to see that kind of feedback. Now, let's talk about these games. In order to do this, I'm using BoardGameGeek. I'm showing their pages, and again, I'm going in alphabetical order, which is why we're starting with 18 Uruguay. Uh, this is an 18xx game set in Uruguay with cattle farming, exports overseas, and nationalization. Now, I don't have a ton to talk about here because I am far from an expert in 18xx games. I've only played a couple of them, and they are not my favorite kind of train game, but I am trying to get into them more right now. And um, this game in particular was designed by Pontus Nielsen, and they designed Stellar Gauge, which is a cube rails game that's still being developed, and I'm actually doing a bunch of playtesting for. So I'm a bit of a fan of Pontus's designs, and so that's why this really jumped out to me. Um, now, this has standard 18xx type stuff, but the new stuff is there is pick up a deliver going on, there's a foreign investor mechanism and nationalization. In addition to that, I'm pretty sure there's like a ship track or something like that, uh, where, yeah, you can do things around the outside. I I'm not really sure how any of this stuff works, but it's also cool to see an 18xx game specifically dedicated to Uruguay and exploring that region at that period of time that it's set. Um, so again, I really don't have anything else to say about the game beyond this looks neat and it's by a game designer that I am actively enjoying other games from. Um, so who knows, maybe this will be the next 18xx game I try. It's not fully published yet. It says looking for a publisher at this point. So who knows when it will be available. Although. I could also just ask Pontus. <laughs> so I might be able to do that uh, somehow before it actually gets released. Uh, either way, we can now move on to Seven Empires. Uh, this says, a bit like Imperial, but this time without money and without a rondelle. <laughs> so this game is designed by Matt Gertz, published by P.D. Verlag, and uh, it, this is obviously referencing Imperial and probably Imperial 2030 uh, as well, which are games designed by Matt Gertz that had rondelles and they had money. So, so far, there's not a lot of specifics about this game beyond that it's uh, a two to six player game and there are seven empires that are in the game called Seven Empires uh, with Great Britain, the Kingdom of France, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and it says you're going to be building up cities so that they can provide better military units, frigates, corvettes, infantry, and artillery, each having a different military uh, capability. And yeah, it, it seems like this is maybe just a new take on Imperial. Uh, that was kind of a stocksy troops on a map sort of game where you essentially bought into stocks in countries. And if you had the most stocks in a country, you could do stuff with that country, like build troops and uh, and move them around the map. But you might like expand the military of one country and then somebody would take the stock away from you or like beat you in the number of stocks. And then they'll take all those troops you just made and then send them into another country that you already controlled. And that's exactly how my games of Imperial 2030 went. I was very bad at that game. Um, I haven't tried that game in like 10 plus years. It's part of the reason why I thought I didn't like stocks in games because I was really frustrated by Imperial uh, 2030. And so, I don't know, I'm intrigued. I, I really enjoy other Matt Gertz designs, um, like Concordia in particular. Um, and this one is, I don't think, going to be anything like Concordia. I guess that's a long way of saying, now that I like stocks a lot more in my games, I am curious to come back to Imperial. And if I'm going to do that, maybe I'll do that by checking out this Seven Empires instead. Um, not having a rondelle is something that I don't really care about. I don't mind rondelles, and I'm honestly kind of curious to see what mechanic uh, Mac brings in to replace it. Um, and then it says it doesn't have money, and that has me very curious, because from what I remember from a very long time ago, you spend money to get those stocks in the country so that you can control things. So if there's no money, how is it controlled? I don't know. I'm curious, and I'm looking forward to learning more. Next up, we have Balconia. It says, construct an apartment complex and create combos to get the most points. Uh, now, this is the first of probably a few games I'm talking about today that I'm not personally, like, crazy excited to play this game. Like, if I never play this game, that's fine. But it looks like it has a cool mechanical gimmick, and I like to highlight games that seem to be doing something different, like a new idea. Uh, that's not me saying I think this game is going to be bad. I just think it's not going to be for me, but it might very well be for other people. And the thing that first drew me into it is this image right here. So you have this um, stand of cardboard that goes between you and your opponent. It's a two-player only game. And inside of it, there's all these square compartments. It almost looks like a Connect Four or something like that. But you're not dropping things down from the top. Instead, on your turn, you're putting these square cardboard balconies 
into the slots. And in particular, the way you do that is going to always have one type of balcony facing you and another type of balcony facing your opponent. And every single one of these tokens has essentially um, well, I guess four options, but two pairs, right? The front back and you rotate it 90 degrees and then there's the new front back. And when we look at the description of the game, it says each turn, one of the players will be choosing two sides of a building block. And then it's the other person who decides where it goes. So it almost seems like a uh, new kind of take on I split you choose. Like you're not making multiple piles. You're saying this is the block that you must play and you must choose these two sides as opposed to those two sides. But then of course that opponent gets to decide where that goes and which of the two main orientations it goes in. Um, that seems fascinating. And then I think you just reverse. And then after that happens, that person chooses which one it'll be and which orientation and then you get to decide where it is and which you know side it gets facing out that's really all i know <laughs> there's a bunch of icons again it's called balconia so it seems like it's all about balconies <laughs> when we uh, zoom in it looks like there are multipliers for various icons i think you're probably trying to do various euro game set collection and combinations from various icon types it just seems like a really neat idea for a game and uh yeah if i if i had the opportunity to play this i don't think i'd turn it down even though i'm probably not gonna be hunting it out if that makes sense Next up, we have Baronda. This is a game that came out in 2023, I think specifically at the Tokyo Games Market that happened about a month ago. And it says, find out after you bid whether you need more or fewer tricks than you bid. Um, if it wasn't obvious, this is a trick-taking game. And I learned about this game because several people in the kind of trick-taking circles I inhabit have been saying this is one of their favorite games that they got to play over the last couple of weeks. It seems like it's, it's really standing up amongst a sea of other new trick-takers that are coming out. And it seems like the conceit is very simple. It says it's a must-follow trick-taking game with simultaneous bids where you score points by taking at least as many tricks as you bid if the total number of bids of the players is too high or by taking no more tricks than you bid if the total number of bids is too low. So what that means is you all simultaneously decide how many tricks you think you're going to win. And when you add all of that up, if it's more than the collective number of tricks that will happen, then you are trying to meet your bid or exceed it. But if everybody is reticent and the number of bids is less than the number of tricks that will happen, then you're trying to duck. So you're spending an entire hand trying to get your tricks or ducking on these tricks. So you're not changing in the middle of a hand, but the kind of texture of the play space is going to vary from one hand to the next based off of how everybody bid. Um, apparently there is a special Naga card, which is higher than Trump and a pass card, which is the lowest card. Uh, beyond that, it seems like it's probably a relatively straightforward must follow trick taker. Um, I'm curious about this one. It, it, honestly, if people whose opinions I respected weren't talking about this, I wouldn't have mentioned it in this game's right off vlog. It seems just very straightforward and simple, but um, people who really know trick taking games are saying this is really standing out. So sometimes there's some very cool things and very interesting play spaces that can happen from really simple rules. And it seems like this might be one of those games. So hopefully I'll have a chance to try this at some point. I don't think I'm going to be importing it or anything like that, uh, but who knows, a, a, an implementation online might pop up at some point. Next up, we have an older game. This is Big City, and it came out first in 1999. There was a 20th uh, anniversary jumbo edition that came out in 2019 from, uh, looks like, Mercury Games. But anyway, this game jumped onto my radar um, probably about four weeks ago or so. I, I honestly can't remember why. I think somebody was mentioning that it was in an auction, like, hey, check it out. You can actually get a copy of uh, uh, of Big City. And I was like, what is that? And after looking into it, I got pretty intrigued. I didn't buy it or anything like that. But this game says it has wonderful plastic bits and it's all about building a city. Players acquire cards in eight different neighborhoods and then they use them to lay out buildings either one, two, or three spaces large. The points they receive for a given building is a base score plus bonuses for buildings that are surrounding it. But what makes this game really unique is the city hall. Some players must play it and this scores no points for that player. But then once that happens, you unlock new structures and residences that people can play out onto the board. So it's my understanding, I watched a couple of videos that the game starts out somewhat basic as you're putting various buildings down. And then once somebody puts a city hall down, that really expands the variety of these big plastic tiles that you can put down onto this expanding city board. And then you get points for doing things. <laughs> and I don't fully understand how all that works, but um, I don't know. I'm intrigued. I like polyomino type situations. I especially like it when it's a competitive communal building situation where everybody's building the city together, trying to squeeze out as many points as they can in various ways. Um, this is certainly the kind of game that I would like to play. Like if given the opportunity, I would jump at the chance, but I don't think I'm going to seek it out just based off of what I've heard so far. So 
Maybe at some point at like Board Game Geek Con or something like that, I'll get the opportunity to try this one out. Next up, we have Catan New Energies, which sounds like an old game, but it's not. It's a 2024 release. It says, build power plants on Catan, weighing the merits of fossil fuels versus clean energy. Now, I haven't necessarily mentioned this in the uh, radar vlogs, but Settlers of Catan was my gateway game into the falling down the rabbit hole of board games uh, back in 2000. Eight? Yeah, 2008, some friends taught it to me, and I was like, what? And then, you know, the rest is history. Um, so I have a big soft spot in my heart uh, for Catan. I've played it dozens of times way back then, and I've barely played it over the last um, probably 12 or so years. Um, and part of me wants to try it again. I have a copy in our collection. I, I just haven't played it in a very long time because there's so many other games to play. But now this comes along, and it makes me pretty intrigued. Um, it says that it's the 21st century, and Catan is at a crossroads. Long gone is the agrarian society of the island's Viking ancestors. Instead, today's Catanians need energy to keep society moving and growing, but pollution is wreaking havoc on the island. You must decide, are you going to invest in clean energy resources or opt for cheaper fossil fuels, potentially causing disastrous effects on the island? It says this is a standalone game rooted in the classic Catan mechanisms of harvesting, trading, and building, but there are new New gameplay elements including power plants, energy tokens, and environmental events that add new strategies and stories to a familiar foundation. Um, so yeah, it seems like it's just, it's not just like a new Catan. I, I could be wrong. There's so many versions of Catan that come out and it seems like every time a new one comes out, it's like, oh, Catan, but you know, Game of Thrones or, oh, it's Catan in the Stone Age or whatever. I'm not even sure if they made one, but it wouldn't surprise me if they did. But this one seems like it, it has a lot of mechanical new things while also looking like the original Catan. Like it's not trying to look like something else. It's just like a modern Catan in a lot of ways. And there are these player boards that have a variety of these tokens on them, various energy types, I'm assuming. It looks like there's costs in order to do these things. Uh, when we look at images of the, the actual board itself, there's familiar stuff like what appears to be towns um, and also roads, but there's also these energy tokens that are out there in spots along the perimeter where maybe you're going to put stuff down. There's still cards. Um, there, It looks like the longest trade route in the cleanest environment, maybe that's instead of uh, having the, uh, the most soldiers, uh, is one way to get some points. So it seems like it still has a lot of Catan things going on. And again, in that, my heart, I have this very soft space for Catan. I love the trading element in the game. I love the board-based elements of the game. And yeah, I can be super frustrated by how the dice can sometimes really not go your way. And so I'm very curious to learn more about this game to see how um, these new mechanics work. Like, are they going to affect the dice in any way? Is there going to be any kind of mitigation things coming in? Not that the game necessarily needs that, but I just want to know more. Uh, it's very possible, after learning more about this one, I decide I want to get it, again, just because of the history I have with it, and it'd be great to have an excuse to get it played again, especially like a new take on the game, like a really new take with extra mechanics. Maybe some of the other versions of Catan that have come out have uh, new mechanical innovations akin to this that I just haven't paid attention to, but for some reason, this one is sticking out to me. All right, next up we have Clans and Glory. It says, get the best followers to join your Scottish clan. Uh, I'm talking about this one entirely because it's designed by Gabrielle Bubola and Leo Colavini. Um, I don't love every Leo Colavini design, but I always find them intriguing and I frequently do love them. And there's really not much on the Board Game Geek page for this game yet. It says, in Clans and Glory, you take part in an ancient ritual. The free people of the Scottish Highlands have come from near and far to the meeting place to join a clan chief. Can you win over the best followers? You have to assemble the strongest Scottish clan through clever map reading and skillful planning. And that's it. <laughs> There's no other details online uh, beyond uh, what appears to be a screenshot of a subsection of a trade magazine that shows the cover. <laughs> so um, there's really not much beyond uh, the designer pair who've done uh, many games in the past. Uh, and I'm curious to learn more. This might turn into a game I'm not super interested in. It is two to four players in 20 minutes, which is very quick. Um, I, I say this in almost every Games Radar vlog, but generally if a playtime listed on BGG is less than 30 minutes, my interest in it diminishes. But um, my intrigue to learn about what Leo Colavini is up to this time has me subscribing to this one so I can learn. And then who knows, maybe I won't be actually be interested in it once I learn that. All right, next up we have Dwarven Rails. It says players buy into train companies in a fantasy steampunk world. And that was enough for me to 
click this subscribe button very hard and very quick. I was like, ooh, this sounds very cool. And then I read more. There's not a ton, but what is on BGG is very intriguing. In the description, it says players compete in a somewhat traditional cube rails game set in a fantasy steampunk world. In addition to the open information game of a traditional cube rails game, this game includes two modules intended to alter the gameplay significantly. The first module is Peoples of the Dwarven Kingdom module, which adds asymmetrical abilities to every player. And then the second module is events. Players can choose to play with neither one or both of these modules for three different types of games. It says the game borrows some mechanics and is inspired by Robin David's Lose on Rails while departing significantly. Um, that's all there is, and I am super intrigued by this one. I've actually already reached out to the designer to see if there's some way I could make an online implementation to play it early just to see what's going on. I liked Lose on Rails. I didn't love it. I only played it once, and I actually sold my copy for a pretty reasonable uh, price. I wouldn't have minded keeping it, but uh, it's gone. And actually, I've heard there's a new version of Lose on Rails coming out uh, that Sai Beppu is doing the artwork for, and it looks stunning. And it has me wondering if I'm going to end up buying Lose on Rails the second time. But here we are with Dwarven Rails uh, from a designer that I'm not familiar with, but from a mechanical world that I am super familiar with. I am very into the Cube Rails uh, niche, <laughs> and I have been for several years now. And I just like the idea of Dwarven Rails of steampunk fantasy uh, things going on of asymmetrical player powers, which is, I think, one of the optional things that came with Luzon Rails. I, I can't remember exactly. Luzon Rails did a couple of things that were kind of innovative in the cube rail space, and it seems like, for the most part, people who really like cube rails and train games maybe weren't sold on those uh, new things that Luzon Rails brought in, in particular um, card-based action selection and a two-dimensional stock market where you use dice. You don't roll them, they're counters. And I'm very curious to see which mechanics Dwarven Rails is borrowing. Is it going to be using the card play mechanism, which in theory I don't hate. I'm not sure if I loved it with that one particular incarnation, but again, I only played Luzon Rails once. So at this point, that's really all there is. There is an image of the cover, which... Uh, is uh, understated, but I think also very evocative. Like, I I'm very bought in to this uh, cover, which makes sense. Uh, there there's a lot of discussion in the train games community about artwork in train games. Um, a lot of people want very basic looking games that almost look like prototypes so that it's crystal clear what's going on so you can play the game to the best of your ability without nice fancy art. And there's other people who like fancy artwork, beautiful illustrations and whatnot in their games. And I think that the compromise in the middle, maybe closer to the simplified end, is where things should go. And I'm hopeful, based off of the uh, cover here, that maybe that's where they're going to be going. Like, maybe there's going to be some really nice stuff happening, but things that aren't, like, blowing out the, the impression that you have of the board when you're trying to parse where all the trains are and whatnot. Either way, I've talked a surprising amount of time for a game that does not have much information about it online, but I am super intrigued by Dwarven Rails. Honestly, not that many Cube Rails games come out these days, at least not consistently, so when I can talk about one on a Games Radar vlog, I jump in the chance. Okay, next up we have Epos Agentis Game. Uh, it says, campaign type game, <laughs> right over here. Uh, now it says it's a Gentis game, and the designer is Stefan Risthaus, and that is the designer of Gentis, uh, which was first published by Spielworks, and then I think somebody else did that one. I can't remember exactly, but anyway, um, this one seems like it is borrowing some ideas from Gentis, but it is its own game. In fact, down below in the forums, the designer made a whole uh, post describing how this game is different from Gentis, but also similar, why it's not being listed as a re-implementation of Gentis, but more in the Gentis line of games, essentially. Um, now, <laughs> I made a non-sponsored video. Yeah, I don't think it was sponsored for Gentis, a full uh, playthrough back when I was doing those. And I don't remember anything about the game. <laughs> it's been years since I made that video, but I remember liking the game, but not really enjoying the board-based elements of it. This is a, a card-based game where you're um, kind of, you're spending time as a, a resource and doing a variety of other things. And from what I was able to glean from that forum post, the board element of this game, of Epos, has been uh, overhauled entirely and accentuated. Um, it, it didn't seem all that integrated in the previous game, and now looking at this, um, probably a prototype version of the, the board, although it does look pretty nice, there's a much more complex map situation going on. And it seems like, um, and again, I'm kind of doing a Cliff Notes version of the forum post that you can totally read if you want to learn more about it. It seems like the ability to like put something down was, was quite hard to do in the original game. It, it cost a lot of resources and action power. And in Epos, it seems like you were going to gradually work your way there, like moving uh, figures onto a spot. And then once there's enough there, you can turn them into a city and that kind of thing. 
it just seems like this is a new take on Gentis. Like looking at this board and looking at the various icons, it feels like it's going to be like 60 to 70% the same game as Gentis or or very, very similar to Gentis. And then like 30 to 40% quite new stuff. And that sounds great because I liked Gentis, but I did not love it. And that leaves me wanting to try this new version out quite a bit. And fortunately, I guess I kind of buried the lead on this one. I did not mean to. I'm going to be making a sponsored tutorial for this one for Spielworks. So uh, I guess, you know, take everything I'm saying with a grain of salt. Um, you know, <laughs> I am going to be somewhat biased here, but legitimately, I would be just as excited to learn more about this one if I wasn't being paid to make a video. And the fact that I'm going to have a copy sent to me and I get to learn it here uh, as part of my job is uh, just one of the perks of my job. All right, let's move on to Far Away. Uh, this is a game where you explore a mysterious land and fulfill quests on your way back. Uh, now, hearkening back a few games, I mentioned if a game is 30 minutes or less, my interest in it definitely goes down. And this is a 15 to 30 minute game for two to six players. So definitely not like my wheelhouse for the kind of weight of game I want to play. But after looking into this game, it seems like it might have released at Spiel. Like it seems like it's actually out. Um, it seems like it has some pretty cool ideas. So at a very high level, um, you're going to be placing eight tiles down um, in the game. You start at one end and you work your way to the other. This is kind of two rows underneath each other, but it's essentially a line of tiles. And as you place these, once you get to the very end, you will score from the end backwards based off of the tiles that are to the right of them. Essentially, that means the order in which you put these tiles down is going to matter as far as set collection of various icons and various other things that you can do to get your points. Um, and this is a simultaneous uh, selection game where you all decide from three tiles which tile you want to put down. You flip it over and then based off of the initiative on those tiles, you in that order will take new tiles from the middle into your hand that you can then play out in the next turn. And again, it's only eight turns. Then you score up and see who won. Uh, so this is a game that I'm not going to jump out and try to buy, but if I had the opportunity to try it, I, I definitely would. It seems like a very clean, elegant design, and I do really enjoy seeing those and experiencing those in games, even if sometimes they're in games that are maybe a little bit lighter weight and quicker than I'm necessarily looking for. Also, I think the artwork is lovely in this game. I, I, I really dig it. So yeah, I would jump at the chance to give this one a try if I had the opportunity. Next up, we have In the Footsteps of Marie Curie. Uh, it says, help the famous scientist win her double Nobel Prize in this family game. Now, again, 20 to 30 minutes, uh, so not really my wheelhouse, but I do want to reiterate that I like sharing interesting ideas in games, or at least what seems to be interesting ideas in these vlogs. It's not 28 games that Jonathan Cox is crazy excited about. It's 28 games that have piqued my interest in one way or another, many of which I do want to play, but many I could kind of take it or leave it. This is probably in the leave it category, but I do want to talk about it because I like the idea of the theme for the most part. Uh, it says, in this family game, you enter Marie Curie's laboratory and help the famous scientist win her double Nobel Prize. You conduct experiments, improve your workshop, and complete Marie Curie's research before the other players. In the Footsteps of Marie Curie is a game featuring resource management and transformation mechanics with a card river and contracts. Resource distribution uh, is done with a cube tower, which are, is always fun, and the retention or overproduction of these brings a set of surprises each turn. Players progress on a central board through Marie Curie's life timeline, and the game ends when players reach the end of this timeline. Uh, there's really not much other information besides a nice-looking uh, box cover. Uh, I I think the story of Marie Curie is fascinating. I think she was uh, an incredible pioneering scientist, and I guess I just like the idea of highlighting a game that is highlighting her life's work, essentially, as you're trying to help her out, I guess, uh, in the game while you're playing. Although I, I do think it's uh, competitive. You're kind of, I guess, working alongside or I guess in the footsteps of Marie Curie. And I don't know how informational and uh, educational this is going to be, but as it's a family weight game, 20 to 30 minutes, this feels like the kind of game that you could play potentially with children and teach them about Marie Curie, about the, the hazards <laughs> that come along with uh, doing science, especially doing science in the late 1800s. Um, anyway, I hope this is actually a fun game because I really like the premise of it, and uh, I hope that some of you are intrigued enough to look into this one more. All right, next up we have Into Deep, which says 2023, so maybe it came out already? Probably it came out already, considering it's 2024. Uh, now, when I first saw this, I was like, oh, I know that game. I made a sponsored video for it, but that is a totally different game. There are multiple Into Deeps. So this is completely different. Uh, that one was like a noir, cyberpunk, futuristic game. And this one is all about investing in the right deep sea companies and being careful not to go in too deep. And, you know, the more I read about this game, the more I was like, 
Yeah, I'm in. I'm sold. So it says, in the game of Into Deep, players are investors in deep sea companies. Your objective? It's to build the most valuable share portfolio. Of course. <laughs> when you think of going too deep in the water, you're definitely thinking about share portfolios. Uh, you're going to buy shares in five different companies and let them dive deeper into the abyss and receive profit for your investments. Now, you do have to pay attention to which companies you invest in, however, as each company has an ability that you can use to your advantage. For example, buying a share with a discount, gaining extra profits, or discarding a card from the company of your choice. With double-sided company cards, there are 32 unique combinations uh, of abilities, making this game totally different. And uh, it asks, will you become the most successful investor? I like investing in games. I like stocks these days. It's definitely a big uh, thing that I enjoy. And looking at some of the images of this game, it appears that it's a card game. Um, I don't actually see any other components than cards. It seems like it's probably a relatively small box. And I'm just very intrigued to see how this works. Um, uh, again, it seems like the game is probably out. I don't even know if I looked on BGG. Hmm, there's no files or any posts in the forums. So... I'm not really sure. Either way, I really want to learn more about this one. It seems like the kind of game that I, I certainly could enjoy. Um, I, I just like investing in things. I like the overall art, and I like the the theme of investing in these uh, submarine deep diving companies. Uh, it just seems different from your standard investing in trains kind of situations. Next up, we have Kathmandu. It says, lead an expedition and explore the diverse landscapes of Nepal. Uh, the main reason I'm talking about this is the designer is Stefan Feld. Um, every time I talk about Stefan Feld in a Games Radar vlog, I have to say, Stefan Feld is not my favorite designer, but I'm usually compelled by Stefan Feld's designs enough to want to talk about them and highlight them because uh, I think there can be some really interesting stuff. I've enjoyed most Stefan Feld games that I played, and this one seems like it has some neat ideas. Now, uh, technically, this game is in the Queen Games Stefan Feld Cities collection. Um, there have been a whole bunch of these games that have been coming out recently, and many of these are re-implementations of previous Stefan Feld games, but I don't think this is. Um, so it says, this is a game where you play in rounds in which each player uses three of five dice to gain resources and move around the landscape boards. The end goal is visiting Kathmandu. Along the way, players gain points through different means like visiting temples, trading for goods in the cities, discovering each landscape, and drawing the many unique animals that call Nepal their home. It says the players need to be efficient on their turns to achieve as much as possible, but also not to waste too much time since there is a storm coming. You should always be in the front of the storm, and you don't want to lose sight of Kathmandu since reaching it before the end of the game yields many extra points. It says points, points, points. So it seems like this is probably a somewhat standard Stefan Feld game in that way that you get points for doing a whole bunch of things. But I have to admit, seeing things like, okay, you roll five dice, and then you use three of them, you're, you're traveling around, it kind of reminds me of the Oracle of Delphi, which is my favorite Stefan Feld game. Uh, now, Oracle of Delphi does not have any victory points, but it does have a wonderful dice manipulation and use system for racing around uh, the Greek archipelago, trying to complete various tasks in order to win the game. I'm not saying that I think Kathmandu is a re-implementation of the Oracle of Delphi at all, because it seems like there's a lot of emphasis on points and whatnot. But I guess this is my saying that I really like some of Stefan Feld's dice manipulation mitigation mechanics in the past. So that makes me quite curious to see how that one is going to work here in the future. And I also like Stefan Feld's wandering around doing stuff games in the past, like Oracle of Delphi. So I don't want to overstress that comparison because they might really not be comparable when we actually learn more about the details. But I'm curious to learn more about all of those things. Next up, we have Keyside. It says, move boats into the harbor, then put their wares to use in your village. Um, pretty straightforward stuff. The reason I'm talking about this is because the designer of the game is Richard Brees, although David Churchy is also a co-designer, uh, and it's being uh, published by R&D Games, and this is another key game. Uh, it says down here that the game is played over three years, and in each year, you have two phases, landing and resolving harbors. So in the landing phase, the lead player uses a die to move a boat into a harbor, then they place a boatman the die and a worker into that harbor, and then other players can join in. And this is the part that really starts to draw me in. I'm curious to learn more about every key game that comes out. Um, they're not all my favorite, but I I've quite enjoyed some of them. In particular, Keyflow and Keeper are brilliant. I, I think they're exceptional games. And um, it looks like this game has some Keeper in it. Uh, it says down here, when you are resolving the harbor phase, the lead player is going to choose a harbor to resolve that contains one of their workers, and then all players with workers in that harbor gain a benefit such as gaining resources, animals, building a headland, access to farms, markets, skill tiles, and worker placement and recruitment. Just a whole bunch of stuff that you get. But the key thing there, again, is <laughs> key, uh, that one person says, hey, this is going to happen, and then other people get stuff on that same turn. Essentially, 
cooperatively, competitively working together. And that's one of the elements I loved about Keeper, where it was kind of a worker placement game, but if I go to a spot and then you go there as well, we both get a really big benefit. So that, that kind of shared element I really enjoy. And I'm not sure how much of that is here, but it seems like there is some. And there is a little bit of information down uh, in the in the page. There's one post in the forums, and I'm pretty sure that post specifically mentioned that there is some Keeper DNA inside this game. And Keeper is one of my two favorite key games. So that definitely grabs my attention. Um, yeah, I I'm looking forward to learning more. I, I do think, based off what I saw in that forum thread, that this game is not coming out until the later end of this year. And it seems like we probably won't get too many more details for many months, so I've subscribed to it, and I'll learn more about it when uh, more is there to be learned. Okay, next up we have La Chita, which is new and old. <laughs> so this is a 2024 game. It says you attract citizens to your cities, but don't forget to feed them, but this is a re-implementation of La Chita, which came out in 2000. <laughs> so uh, 24 years ago, geez. Um, so this is a new version of La Chita, and this is a game that I've heard about just vague whispers. Uh, I never looked into it. And the more I did look into it, the more I realized this game looks very cool. Like it looks like my kind of game. It's a classic interactive mean Euro uh, where you're doing stuff on a board. Uh, let's see the re-implementation. There's not much in the way of images. So looking at the old version, just to get some idea of the board, um, you have these kind of triangular hex clusters and then these kind of trails of hexes going all around them. And it's my understanding that while you're playing the game, you're occupying various spots with your uh, your cubes. I, it might not be cubes in the new version. I don't really know all of the specifics. I did not read the rule book, even though I, I certainly could have. But I came away uh, from looking at this game being very intrigued to check this one out. I talked to some friends who do have experience with it, and they said that they really like what they saw. Um, now, specifically for the 2024 version, it's being published by Korea Board Games, who makes very good-looking games. And when we look down here, uh, specifically at the bottom, it says, in this game, which is a re-implementation of the original La Chita, uh, it contains a new expansion that includes new buildings, new politics cards, and new terrain tiles. So for people who know and love La Chita, it looks like there's something here for them as well with new stuff. Um, in addition to probably a really good looking game, it would not surprise me based off of the publisher. So that's kind of all I have so far. Honestly, just talking about this now makes me feel like I should really just read the rule book <laughs> and learn more about it because it seems like it's definitely my current jam, uh, so to speak. I really like older elegant euros where you get in each other's face and make each other's life very hard. And it seems like this might be one of those. And having a fancy looking new version come out uh, definitely pulls my interest. All right, next up we have Moby Trick. <laughs> it's a 2024 game. It says, claim cards from tricks to score them while giving their player special abilities. I love puns. <laughs> so this was probably going on the Games Radar vlog uh, for no other reason than it's called Moby Trick instead of Moby Dick, and it's a trick-taking game. I love it. <laughs> so uh, the designer of this game is Jochen Knittel, and it's their only uh, design on BGG. And the game itself does actually look pretty interesting. Uh, it says that narwhals are the trump suit in Moby Trick, but not all always because the orcas, sperm whales, and blue whales also turn the tide. All the familiar rules of trick-taking games apply, so I imagine must follow and all that kind of thing, uh, but it says there is a special twist. Whomever wins the trick chooses a card that has been played and scores it. So, you know, you all put a card out, and then the winner looks at a card and takes it, and then the player who put that card down receives a special bonus effect for uh, one of the next rounds. So, you're getting stuff when it's not your turn. I love that kind of stuff uh, where, you know, you lose the trick, but they decide to choose your card so you get a benefit anyway. Sure, they score it, which means they're probably getting points in some way, shape, or form, but you get that benefit. And I really like getting stuff when it's not my turn. And I also, in uh, trick-taking games, really like it when playing not to win the trick is still a decent thing. Um, most trick-taking games these days, or I guess historically, are must-follow, which means if you play a red card, I must play a red card. And if I don't have any red cards, I can play anything I want, but I cannot win the trick. And uh, I like that in this game, it seems like if you play a card that cannot win, at least maybe from a scoring perspective, you can entice the person who does win to take that from you and get a benefit anyway. Um, now, there's always, it there looks like there's trump things going on, so you could potentially trump offsuit and whatnot. But again, I really like it in trick takers where when you offsuit, knowing you're not going to win a trick, you still get some sort of benefit, or at least there's something to think about um, beyond like, what card do I not want in my hand anymore? And it seems like this game might have it. Also, it's got a great pun <laughs> in the name. 
Okay, next up we have Motcoin. It's a 2023 release because it just released at the Tokyo Games Market about a month ago. It says buy coins that are sure to make big profits as the prices continue to rise. Uh, and this game looks very cool. Honestly, uh, a friend of mine sent me the Japanese rules and I translated them and I'm actually in the process of trying to make an online implementation to try with myself because it looks like a lot of fun. It is an auction style game that uses dice as a uh, currency. You don't roll these dice, they're just markers. And the way the game works is you have cards and you have dice and the cards make up a deck of 24 and all of them have a unique number on them. And you're gonna go through that entire deck through two different phases and you essentially reveal a card and then everybody's gonna be bidding on that card. And you bid by taking dice from your reserve and putting them next to the card and you choose. You could take a die and make it a six or you could take a die and make it a four or you could take three dice and make it six, four or four. And the person who wins that card wins the auction is the person who played the single highest value. So if you put three fours down and I put one five, I win it because five is better than four. It doesn't matter how many fours you have. And once somebody wins, um, they actually take the card and the dice they used and they leave the die on top of it as essentially the currency. So they don't have access to that die until it goes away. And the way they go away is by other people winning auctions. When you win auctions, there's a fluctuation effect that affects everybody else. Usually it lowers the value of the dice on the cards they already have. Sometimes it increases them, uh, but for the most part, they go down. And at the end of the game, you kind of have a almost inverse no thanks thing going on. Um, no thanks is a, uh, an auction game, an inverse auction game that came out a long time ago where you're trying to get sets of cards like the 22, 23, 24, and whatnot to score points for those and you don't want to have gaps. And um, I guess now that I think about it, Motcoin is a lot like that because at the end of the game, you can stack your cards if there's a gap between them. So like 27, 29, 31 can all still stack together. It doesn't have to be one to one to one, but if there's too big of a gap, they don't stack. And that's important because all the stack cards go underneath the highest in that stack. And then each one of those is worth the value of that highest card. So if you have um, 28, 30, 32, that means you actually have three 32s because the 28 and the 30 tuck underneath it. And that's 32 times three or, or um, 66 points. Don't do math <laughs> live when recording uh, that you get, but you lose points for the dice that are still on your cards at the end of the game. And every card has a crash value. So it's possible. <laughs> I've seen some of these cards of a crash value of like minus 12, where for every pip on that card, you lose 12 points. So if there's, you know, three pips on that doing math live again, then that's minus 36 points just for those there. And so that means you want to win cards with the right amount of pips on your dice at the right time. You don't want to put too many down near the end of the game because they won't be able to decrease fast enough in order for you to actually make a profit on that card. And of course, when other people are winning auctions, they're, they tend to lower your dice. Now, Again, I've read the rules. I've not actually played it yet, but it just seems like it's doing a lot with a pile of regular D6 dice and like 24 cards. I'm just very intrigued to see how this goes. Uh, hopefully I can have a chance to play it um, with some of my friends. Like I said, I have a couple friends who actually bought this one from the Tokyo Games Market and who have already said that they've enjoyed the plays of it that they've done. All right, next up we have Nassau. It says, be a pirate and go on adventures to tell your tales. Uh, once again, it's a Steffenfeld game. Uh, so this is another, it's the, the second of the, uh, the City series games that Steffenfeld is coming out that I'm talking about in this game's radar vlog. And this one in particular seems that it is actually a re-implementation of Ramen Pirates, I think it's called. Uh, I never actually played it. It's an older Steffenfeld game that it seems like most people really don't like. Um, and this seems to be a new take on that. Uh, so it says over here that you take on the role of pirates going on adventures. Each of you has their own ship uh, that needs a competent crew, armed to the teeth, lots of cannons, ammunition, and provisions to thrive, navigating the seas, conquering outposts, fighting sea monsters, and plundering valuable goods. That is quite the sentence. Um, you are going to tell your tales over a bottle of rum and impress your fellow pirates, and who can tell the best tales. Under the mechanics, it says dice rolling, set collection, and variable setup. I have no experience with uh, rum and pirates, I, I think was what the other one was called. Uh, yeah, yeah, somebody is talking, <laughs> they think it actually sounds better than that. Um, I have no experience with that pre previous game. I've just heard that people don't tend to like it. Um, I don't mind adventure Euro games. Uh, like I said before, I think Stefan Feld can come up with some pretty neat ideas for dice. So for the most part, you could just take everything that I said for Katmandu earlier and place it on here. It wouldn't surprise me if the two of these go together in the same Kickstarter from Queen Games, um, like Queen tends to do, and a bunch of information will come out at that point about it. Uh, so yeah, I'm keeping my eye on it. I'm always curious to see what Stefan Feld is up to next. 
Next up, we have Rajas of the Ganges Cards and Karma. So this is a re-implementation of Rajas of the Ganges that came out in 2017. I actually bought that one at Spiel 2017, and I, I quite liked it. I played it three times way back then. And this is a dice uh, placement game where you are also building out your own kind of area in front of you. So um, there is dice that you're going to be taking, and you're going to be using them in a variety of ways to do actions and to move your boats up rivers, and also to build out a kind of tableau that is in front of you. I liked it. I didn't necessarily love it. Uh, but this new game seems like it has some of the similar ideas, but it's definitely different. It, it's shorter. It's a 30 to 45 minute game. And it seems like it's just a card game. Uh, it says that you compete for coveted double-sided cards that show buildings, goods, and ships, and palaces on one side, or actions for those. And on the other side, there's a colored die value. Um, you always have to keep an eye on your opponent's actions and plans because what they would like to build could instead be useful to you as a dice card. Um, so what that right there implies to me is that there's probably some sort of pool drafting type of thing where it's like, I'm going to take this card because it's a red three because it says red three on it. And also because I can tell you really want the backside of that card. And now I have it and it's gone and you don't get to have it. <laughs> and I like that kind of interaction in Euro games for sure. Um, it, it says that you are turning over these six target cards one by one to get fame or money. And one of the original kind of highlights of the of Rajas of the Ganges was the end game condition was you gained money and you also gained points. And the game ended once somebody's money token crossed over their points token. They were going in opposite directions. Arknova, you know, famously has adopted this idea and used that as well. And I'm curious if this game has something similar going on because it does mention getting the fame and the money. Um, I guess it's points and not fame as the other track. Uh, so yeah, I'm just curious to see how this seeming distillation of Rajas of the Ganges uh, comes out. Um, it mentions dice values on the cards. I'm not sure if there's actually dice in the game at all or if it just looks like dice, which makes sense because the base game had a ton of dice. There was also a dice version of the uh, base game uh, that came out. So this is kind of like uh, Rajas of the Ganges, the card game versus Rajas of the Ganges, the dice game, which is a little bit silly because the original Rajas of the Ganges was a dice game. <laughs> Either way, I'm really curious to learn more about this one. It seems like it could certainly be fun. All right, next up we have Shinobu no Gako. It says, playing cards and taking tricks with both of your hands. This game is amazing. <laughs> so I have already played this game twice, and that's why I can say it. Uh, I, I really like this game, but this is not an opinions vlog section. This is where I mention... Uh, where I talk about the game. So I learned about this game last week because a friend of mine, uh, Taylor, who has the Taylor's Trick Taking Table, he put out a, a review of the game. I'd never heard of it before. I watched the review and my jaw just hit the floor. I was like, this game looks like it was built for me. Uh, this is a card shedding game, a climbing card shedding game, where you have two hands. You have a hidden heaven hand that's um, like up here, and then you have an earth hand, which is your cards face up on the table. And every turn, you do something with each of those hands. So you could maybe play cards from the earth and then take cards from the middle into your heaven hand. Or you could play cards from both of them, or you could just take, take, or maybe do nothing with them. And as you're putting these cards down, there's a fascinating restriction where you can't play ranks in the middle of what's been played already. So if there's like, um, you know, three twos out there and two tens, you can't play anything between two and 10. Two is the lowest, 10 is the highest but you could play a couple of 11s. But you can't play something below the two because if there's more of one of, of the lowest and the highest or the highest and the lowest, it locks that side. And it doesn't surprise me if you're going to be confused by everything I just said, uh, but just take my word for it. This game is very interesting. It does a lot with a deck of cards that just one to 13, five times. Uh, I'm very jazzed about it. I've played it twice over the last three days and I could definitely see myself playing this one more. I played it online uh, and this game is very easy to proxy. Again, it's one to 13, five times. And you can watch uh, Taylor's video to get pretty much all of the rules to the game and try this one out yourself. Um, I, I'm very excited about this one. Honestly, card games, I mentioned them in the Games Radar vlog. This is far from the first one I've mentioned in this episode. But my focus and my uh, like drive these days is not necessarily pointed towards card games anymore. I, I went hard on those for like a year and a half. I still really like them, but I'm kind of venturing uh, and looking over more towards, you know, train games and old Euros as, as the, my main focus of my interest. But occasionally a card game still comes up and says, hey, <laughs> and I'm like, oh yeah, okay, that deserves my attention. I want to play that one more. All right, next up we have Ska Bray. It's a 2025 game, so it's not going to be coming out for quite some time. It says you gather resources and shelter the settlers of Neolithic Northern Scotland. The designer of this game is Shem Phillips. The publisher is Shem's publishing company called Garfield Games. And I'm, much like Steffenfeld, I'm always curious to see what Shem comes out with next. Uh, none of Shem Phillips' designs 
are in my top 10 or even my top 20, but I tend to enjoy them when I do have a chance to play them. And it seems like they frequently have quite interesting things going on. I also tend to really like the art style that they have in pretty much all of these games. Um, now, looking specifically at this game, it says around 5,000 years ago, a resilient group of farmers and hunters built a thriving community on the Orkney Islands of Northern Scotland. Rather than discarding their empty shells, broken tools, bones, and other waste, they used them to form large mounds of earth over hundreds of years. Later generations dug into these midden piles to create a series of rooms and tunnels to shelter from the harsh winds and cold winter months. So the aim of Scarabara <laughs> is to gather various resources in order to feed, clothe, and shelter your growing number of settlers. Players take turns drafting cards and using their workers to furnish, cook, craft, clean, and trade. And at the end of each round, players need to provide for the settlers and will likely create more midden that needs to be cleaned up. After four rounds, having the most points wins. That um, thematic mechanical connection seems quite cool. Um, the idea of these essentially piles of trash that, that that accumulate over the course of hundreds of years that suddenly become a thing that you can dig into and make an abode out of sounds fascinating, like from an anthropological perspective, but also from a mechanical perspective. It seems like it's phrasing it like it's maybe a bad thing, but who knows, maybe it's also kind of a good thing. Maybe you can kind of use how these things go. There's not really any other information about this online, but I'm intrigued. It says it's a 45 to 60 minute game, so, you know, into the light to medium weight uh, range. It says it's got track movement and chaining, uh, worker placement, variable player powers. I I'm intrigued. Uh, it seems like the kind of game I would not mind trying, but probably not one I'm going to like rush out and try to uh, buy. But I really do want to learn more about how the mechanics match up with that theme because I've never heard of that before. And it, it sounds fascinating to me. Next up, we have Soror. It says, shed cards up or down to finish on a high value. Now, unlike the other card games, many of which I've talked about recently, um, this one came out a little while ago, and I've not heard anybody talk about this game before. This is not highly recommended or anything. I just kind of liked the premise that it had going on. I like shedding games where you're trying to get rid of all your cards, trying to think about it. And I'm just going to read through this description. It says, Soror is a shedding game from Japan. Players are trying to shed a card from their hand in each turn until they are down to a single card. The value of their last card is their score, and the winner is the player with the highest score after a few rounds. The cards are numbered and are either black or white. The player must play a card following the value lead. If they play a white card, it must be higher than the previous card. And if they play a black card, it must be lower than the previous card. So if you're following a four, a player can place a white five or a black three. Um, but you have to make sure to match those colors up. Uh, if the player cannot follow, they are out of the round with no score. And it just seems like a very simple game. Honestly, this reminds me of FTW, which is a, a climbing shedding game, uh, more just shedding game uh, that was designed by Friedman Fries that came out at Essen Spiel that I was pretty disappointed in. I, I tried that one a few times and it just did not work for me, but I wanted to like that game. And this game came up before that. This game is like, you know, three to four years old. Um, but I, I like the idea of trying to manage this hand of black and white cards. There are some you're trying to go up and some you're trying to go down and you're trying to put yourself in a situation where you're flexible enough to keep playing while also trying to put yourself in a situation to have your last card be a high value card. It just seems neat. It could also flop and not be very interesting at all. Uh, this is a game that I would not mind trying, but I'm not going to try to seek out or hunt down by any means. Uh, it just seems mechanically intriguing for how simple it is. Um, and, and I felt the same way about FTW. Honestly, I, I was very intrigued by that game. I was expecting to like it and I didn't. It's possible if I tried this one, I could have the same exact experience. But considering it's a 15 to 20 minute game, if I had the opportunity to try this, like if somebody made an online version, I would certainly jump at the chance just to see if maybe uh, this version of that kind of mechanic worked out better. All right, next up we have Stella Digger. Uh, this one just came out at the Tokyo Games Market and it's a trick-taking meets space adventure in a thrilling race for resources. So this is actually a... Uh, kind of a hybrid of trick-taking and board game with board-based things. And it says down here that you embark on this asteroid mining adventure, a groundbreaking fusion of trick-taking and map exploration. Your goal is to play drill cards matching the target tile's color. You want to snatch tiles and crystals and strategize with six dynamic actions during your turn. You enhance your mining prowess with gadgets, offering wild hand colors, double card plays, expanded hand size, and more. And you brace yourself for incidents triggered by a deck depletion and unexpected monster appearances on the map. Success could mean a windfall, but survival is the key. Now, I heard about this game because a whole bunch of my friends got it <laughs> at the Tokyo Games Market. I don't think any of them have actually played it yet, but a lot of people got it because they were 
excited by this idea of this fusion of a trick-taking game plus board-based um, kind of map exploration. Uh, looking at some images of the game, it's a good-looking game, like lots of vibrant colors, big numbers. Um, I'm not really sure how this board works, but it appears you are mining a big asteroid, like digging deeper and deeper into it. Um, it appears players have tableaus in front of them. There's tokens. There's a lot going on. And then there's also trick-taking uh, that uh, is, is hypothetically the thing that kind of stitches all the mechanics together. I'm very curious to try this one. And it wouldn't surprise me if I have an opportunity to try it online if one of my friends makes a mod for it, considering so many of them bought the game and are probably really curious to get their game played. Next up, we have Sumida River. You know, I'm talking about more card games than I expected, and I do think that's because the Tokyo Games Market uh, convention trade show just happened about a month ago, so a whole bunch of new card games just came out. Anyway, that's my excuse. Here's another one. It says, try to dish your cards, but you can't match what others have played. Uh, now, this is a shedding game, and this one is recommended. Uh, a friend of mine very much liked it. He said this is one of his uh, favorite card games that he played uh, recently, uh, and so that definitely grabbed my attention. Uh, it says that this is a card shedding game in which you can't play the same number of cards as the previous player. The deck contains 52 cards, with three threes up to 10 tens, and the game includes a swapping rule that allows you to exchange all the cards in your hand, picking up an almost mighty card each time you do so, giving you the opportunity to make weaker cards stronger. So this appears to be in line with the kind of common trend in shedding games, where you can improve your hand as you go. Classically, shedding games, you couldn't. You just had a hand of cards like Teach You. You have your hand of cards and you have to play all your cards and figure out how to do that. But um, it seems like maybe it's been happening for a while, but ever since Scout came out and got very popular, many climbing shedding designs have been coming out where you can get new cards into your hand and you can manipulate your hand. And, you know, I'm I'm one of those people, I designed a game called Spring Cleaning that does exactly that. So I'm part of this overall trend, and it seems like this is like that. Also, that um, uh, Shinobu no Gako that I mentioned earlier is also a climbing game where you can improve your hand as you go. I'm very curious to see what this swapping rule works out to be, and the idea of being blocked by the cards that your previous player played, that, that's a pretty standard thing in climbing shedding games, although usually it's because you're climbing. <laughs> and this just says card shedding game. So maybe there isn't climbing in there. And by climbing, I mean going up or down, which is a pretty common thing in these games, but not always. Anyway, I don't really know much more about this game. It seems pretty simple overall, but um, it's recommended by people who have good taste in card games. So hopefully I'll have a chance to try this one online at some point sooner rather than later. Um, if, if that person's uh, opinion ends up matching a bunch of other people, it wouldn't surprise me if somebody makes a mod for this. All right, next up we have Tallywood Rally. It says politicians campaign and compete for votes in the halfling town of Tallywood. Now, I am going to be making a sponsored tutorial video for this one. I remembered to say that right there at the front. So, of course, I am biased. Uh, this one is published by Final Frontier Games, and I'm very biased. I make a bunch of videos for them. I write a bunch of rule books for them. I did not write the rule book for this game. Uh, now, this says, uh, when, when it says rally, I immediately think of races, but it's actually a political thing. It says, in Tallywood Rally, you will be in charge of your own halfling political campaign. Leverage the plans up your sleeve into clever plays, send assistance to rally and fundraise, increasing your popularity and treasury, pander to voters directly, build public works, and work with celebrities to get out the vote. Um, it says, on your turn, you are going to be using an innovative card mechanism, I love seeing that kind of thing, uh, that allows you to control the actions of your workers. The cards are played into one of four action columns, each with three possible action spaces, and each unique space connects to the icons on the cards in different ways, potentially revealing bonuses on the board itself, including a whole bunch of different actions. Now, they have a couple of images of what the game looks like, and this one in particular is quite intriguing because it, it appears to show those four different rows and cards being placed on those rows, and it, it looks like you're trying to match up like this yarn <laughs> string that's threaded between some nails on this board, uh, trying to piece together a combination. I'm not really sure how any of this works. There's resources being tracked on your player board, but it seems intriguing. And again, I am making a sponsored video for this one uh, that's likely going to be coming out in March, early March. So I'm going to be learning a lot more about this one very soon when I dig into making that video, but I'm intrigued. I don't really play that many games that are politically themed. Um, and I, I like the idea of this card mechanism, at least what I've seen so far. Uh, I'm curious to see if this is one of those videos that's hard for me to make because I'm like, playing and counterplaying against myself <laughs> since I play every single, you know, player in these tutorials. But either way, um, it looks good. I enjoy stuff that Final Frontiers makes. I'm incredibly biased because they're one of my better clients. And hopefully Tallywood Rally ends up being a good game. <laughs> 
All right, next up we have The Anarchy. This is also a 2025 game being published by Garfield Games, but the designer of this one is Bobby Hill. Uh, now, I think it's possible that The Anarchy and Scarabre that I talked about earlier might be bundled up together. I'm not exactly sure, but it looks like this game is actually a kind of spiritual successor to Hadrian's Wall. Uh, thematically, it looks quite interesting. It says, at the end of 1135, Henry I, the king of England, died unexpectedly, leaving no male heir to reign in his stead. Henry's daughter, Empress Matilda, believed she should rule by succession. However, the late king's favorite nephew, Stephen de Blois, was quicker to the throne and, with the help of his brother, the Bishop of Winchester, was crowned king. Those loyal to the empress were enraged by Stephen's coronation and would not accept him as the new ruler or over the next 18 years, that's a long time, uh, England saw a breakdown in law and order as civil war spread across the country. This conflict came to be known as the anarchy. So it says in this game, players take on the role of English nobles loyal to King Stephen. Uh, oh, interesting. I guess you only are loyal to Stephen. And it says over five rounds, players must build their domain, defend their castle from attacks by the approaching Angevin armies and storm strongholds loyal to Matilda with their own crafted siege weapons. And again, uh, based off of descriptions down below, it seems like this is very much tied to Hadrian's Wall from a mechanical perspective. Uh, that means you've got um, chaining, you've got income, you've got multi-use cards, you've got paper and pencil because you're probably going to be drawing on this big pad of paper. And I'm not really sure where the similarities end. I mean, it's a 60 to 90 minute game, so definitely it's got a lot of stuff going on. Um, I imagine much like Hadrian's Wall, it's going to be very focused on the solo experience, but then you can also play with other players. Uh, I liked Hadrian's Wall. I played it a couple times. I don't own it. Um, I'm not interested in getting a copy, but I wouldn't mind playing it more. And that leaves me curious about this one. Um, also, thematically, it seems like a pretty interesting setting to go with. Um, although I wasn't expecting to be forced to fight for one side, but I guess that makes uh, thematically, especially when you consider the bones of this game come from Hadrian's Wall. Next up, we have a tiny epic Game of Thrones. It's a 2024 game. It says, assume the role of a mighty house of the Seven Kingdoms. Uh, now, get my biases out of the way. I am making a sponsored tutorial video for this game, which is not surprising because I've made a sponsored tutorial video for almost every tiny epic game that has come out uh, since tiny epic Western. I, I think that was the last one that I did that was not sponsored. So a lot. Uh, Gambling Games is one of my oldest clients. Um, they want me to do a tutorial and I'm planning on doing it. And this game does seem pretty interesting. Uh, it's a 45 to 60 in a game. Obviously, it's in the Tiny Epic Games line designed by Scott Alms, and they got the IP of Game of Thrones. Uh, so it says down here that you prepare to navigate the perilous world of Westeros, where alliances are fragile, betrayals are common, and the fate of your house hangs in the balance. Players will assume the roles of the mighty houses of the Seven Kingdoms, each vying for power, influence, and control of the Iron Throne. Uh, so down here, it says in Tiny Epic Game of Thrones, players utilize an innovative limited action dice mechanism to strategically choose cards such as plot, whisper, event, march, and sail. With the options to follow other players' actions, players will be engaged every turn. Furthermore, players will yield an immense amount of power with their respective houses through a versatile hand of multi-use cards that allow players to plot against the influential houses of Westeros, orchestrate grandiose events, and partake in exhilarating battles. Uh, now, mechanically, there's a whole bunch of stuff listed. Uh, action event, alliances, area majority, area movement, uh, 11 more. <laughs> there's so many mechanisms listed here. King of the Hill, multi-use cards, hand management, income, follow. But I, I will say that I, I am quite intrigued by the limited action dice mechanism, the the ability to follow other people's uh, actions and this versatile hand of multi-use cards. That's a lot of mechanical jargon right there, but it's stuff that I like to see in my Euro games, uh, especially games that are very interactive, like being able to follow on what other people are doing and play based off of the things that they do and multi-use cards let you be flexible with the options that you have. I don't know anything more about this game than what is here on the page. I, I am making a video, but I've not been sent the rules or anything like that yet. I'm intrigued to learn how this works. I mean, honestly, uh, from a... A personal perspective, I used to be a huge fan of Game of Thrones, uh, the books. Like, I, I read all the books that were out before the shows came out, and, and I, I watched all of the show, and I have various opinions about that, um, and various opinions about the uh, the series itself, but I have a lot of fond memories of the years and years and many books that I read and waited and read and waited, so there is uh, some of a, of a personal tie-in for me here, and I'm curious to see how this game ends up panning out. 
Okay, we've reached the last game I'm talking about today, a game that nobody has talked about before. <laughs> it's Wormspan. Uh, I'm being facetious. This is like one of the most talked about games over the last few weeks. This is a re-implementation of Wingspan, all about dragons. It says, build a cavernous sanctuary for dragons of all shapes and sizes. Uh, it's a one to five player game, 90 minutes, and it was not designed by the designer of Wingspan, which was Elizabeth Hargrave. Um, Elizabeth is a main developer on this game, I believe, but the actual designer is Connie Vogelman, who designed Apiary, which was the previous Stonemaier games that just came out. Um, so this game builds on the mechanic, the core mechanics of Wingspan, where you are putting birds out into rows in your own tableau and then activating those birds again. You're getting uh, eggs that you put down into various spots. And I imagine there's a whole bunch of hand management of these dragons. In, in this world, it's dragons instead of birds. And there's a ton of different dragons. I liked Wingspan. I played it a few times. I sold my copy. Um, and I am quite curious about this one because it seems like it has some new stuff. Like it, it takes the idea of Wingspan and adds some things on top of it, maybe making it a bit of a, a more complex, deeper game, perhaps. Uh, one thing in particular that jumps out to me is the fact that your player board starts out small. They're caves. Um, and at the beginning of the game, your cave is tiny. I think there's only room for one dragon. But as you play through the game, you can dig out your cave, allowing you to put more dragons in there. And that is an element that was not in Wingspan. You could just had all the spaces that were available to you right at the start. I believe there's a few other significant mechanics that are different with Wormspan. Honestly, I haven't played Wingspan in years, like six years or something like that, five years, a long time. So I only at a high level remember how those mechanics work. But I will say that Wormspan looks cool. I like dragons. I think they're cool. I think the artwork looks neat. Uh, I enjoyed Wingspan enough to play it several times. And that leads me in a position where I would very much like to play Wormspan. If I never play it, I don't think I would be heartbroken. Uh, I wouldn't say my excitement is like off the charts or anything like that. But I'm intrigued. You know, like Wingspan is one of the more popular games to come out in the last seven years. And here is a follow-up game with a new theme and some new mechanics. I want to see how this one goes. So yeah, uh, I'm sure a lot more information about this is going to be coming out soon. And that is it for the 28 games that I'm talking about today. Um, I, I had like 900 games that I sorted through uh, to get to this list over the last few weeks. Uh, I had, My short list was about 40 games, so I cut, I guess, 13 games off of that list. Uh, I, I really like researching this kind of stuff, and it's interesting how the types of games that show up on these lists ebb and flow as the year goes on. Uh, you know, the Tokyo Games Market just happened. A bunch of my friends are really excited about the card games that came out, and therefore, here I am talking about a bunch of card games, uh, whereas I'm sure in, you know, like seven months, I, I might not be talking about any card games. Who knows where my personal uh, opinions will be? I do try to cover a variety of games, including games that I'm not personally interested in, but I can't help but have my own biases still be reflected in the games that I talk about in these vlogs. Now, uh, as I said right at the beginning, if you think I missed a game that I really should have talked about, then please leave that as a comment. Also, if you have thoughts about any of the games that I did talk about, leave a comment as well. I love to see that kind of thing. And yeah, that's going to bring this episode to a close. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you too would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos just like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, then please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.